Good evening, folks, family, friends, loved ones, enemies, frenemies, wizards, witches, muggles, mudbloods, people of Middle Earth to another episode of Disguise Coverage, the only podcast in existence that gives you an equal amount of blueberries in each muffin. I am your host, Anthony Prohaska. Find me on Twitter at pro underscore underscore ant. That's pro two underscores A N T. You can also find me on TikTok under the same handle, pro underscore underscore A N T. Post a lot of film footage and video clips and different things you can also find on Twitter. Um, so give both of those a follow because why not? You know, double the pleasure, double the fun. That's a tagline for some company. I don't remember what it is. But nonetheless, here we are on this Wednesday evening live. And we're going to dive into Bill's first round pick, Kyer Elam, from a high-level perspective, something that I think hasn't been touched on too much when it comes to Elam. We've gone in depth with him in the cover one film room, myself and Eric Turner and Kendall Mursky. We went into skill set and traits and specific things that you find in his play style, examples of areas of opportunity, strengths, how you can mitigate his areas of opportunities and weaknesses and play off those strengths, what Coach McDermott and that coaching staff really have to work with. So we've gone in detail in terms of breaking down his game and analyzing what he offers. But in this episode tonight, we're going to dive into three high-level topics for Kyer Elam, more from a scheme perspective and an overall philosophical, overarching umbrella, terminology, thought process, some sort of combination of that. I don't know the exact verbiage to label it, but we're going to take a look at three topics tonight that I'm very excited for the potential of Kyrie Elam bringing to this Buffalo Bills team. And keep in mind with all of that, everything that we're going to talk about tonight and dive into is potential based. I see a lot of people coming into the chat. Hi, everyone. Appreciate you guys for stopping in. Everything that we talk about tonight with Kyrie Elam and any rookie is all potential based. The NFL draft is by no means an exact science. If it was, every single pick would hit for every single team all the time. It is by no means an exact science. It is very much, as much as we don't like to admit it, a crapshoot. And you take all the evaluations from evaluators, coaches, scouts, GMs, draft analysts, pundits, whatever have you, you can show people the same footage. You can show 10 people the same 10 clips, and you could legitimately, realistically, probably get like seven to 10 different evaluations, different, (laughs) see that comment there from Jason that said, I had potential once. We all did, man, dreams die hard. You get different evaluations. You get different analysis for all these prospects. and. So everything that we're talking about that you're going to, everything you're going to hear in the episode tonight and in general for this entire offseason for all these rookies, whether it's the Bills rookies, rookies for other teams, whatever have you, all of it is the potential of what they can do. They are the most unproven of unproven players in the league. You have some guys that are like, oh, they've been in the league one or two years. They're still a little unproven. We still have some questions about who they're going to be or what they're going to become rookies are legitimately the most. And I feel like it sounds obvious to some people, but it it isn't with how rookies get talked about. There are a lot of expectations and hopes that are placed upon rookies shoulders. And I think it's just a feeling of, okay, what you saw them do in college, they're going to be able to do that in the NFL. And it is so far the opposite from that. And so everything with Kyrie Elam that we're going to talk about in tonight's episode, like I've stated and everything with rookies in general, it's all the potential of what they could do the evaluation of what they can become and how translatable their game and their skill sets and their traits are from college to the NFL. So I'm very excited by the potential of Matt Elam, but let's all keep that in mind. We don't want to see another, oh, as we go through it again, we don't want to see expectations be put too high on people's shoulders, a la Tremaine Edmonds, where everybody thought, oh my God, the Bills just traded up for a linebacker. Sean McDermott coached Luke Keekley. Luke Keekley was picked in the first round. <gasps> Tremaine Edmonds was picked in the first round. Oh my goodness, Tremaine Edmonds is going to be the next Luke Keekley. And now everybody, well, not everybody, but a lot of people are consistently upset because Tremaine Edmonds is in fact not Luke Keekley. Not a lot of people are because Luke Keekley is a Hall of Famer and legitimately one of the best linebackers of all time but I digress. So keep that in mind with everything. Everything you see in this episode, this entire offseason, keep that in perspective for all these rookies. Kyer Elam, James Cook, Khalil Shakir, any rookie that you are excited about, temper those expectations for the sake of yourself and not disappointing yourself, but also for the sake of the players. These guys are adjusting to life as a professional player on the field and off the field. It's a huge culture shock. It's a major challenge. And when you place these lofty goals and expectations on these players, 
it can be hard for them to live up to that. And it's not fair to the player. It's not fair to you, the viewer, and the consumer of football. So keep that in mind. But that's to set the table for this episode tonight. And we're going to dive into three high-level topics in regards to Kyer Elam of how he can potentially unlock the Buffalo Bills defense, what his ability, what his skill set and trait potential do for this Buffalo Bills defense in a vacuum of the defense itself, but also on a larger macro scale in terms of the AFC and the NFL in general. And we're going to dive into that in just a quick minute. You guys know how we do. Got to mention the sponsor of the show, the best pizza in Buffalo, hands down, one pie pizza. You see the logo in, I'm terrible at this on the screen chains, bottom right hand of your screen. Well, my left, but we're forget it. I don't know my wife. I don't know why I try to do the direction thing every week. It never works out for me. I still don't get it. So it's a weakness of mine in an area of opportunity. I'll study the tape. I'll get better. Nonetheless, one pie pizza, the best pizza in Buffalo. The online menu can be found in the episode episode show notes here on YouTube or any one of the podcasting apps and platforms you are listening to this episode on. Go to that online menu. Get yourself some one pie pizza. You will not be disappointed. Delicious sweet sauce pie, cup of char pepperoni, a great cheese to sauce ratio, homemade blue cheese. They're doing a ton of drives and initiatives throughout the entire year. This month, uh, they got stuff going on for the SPCA, which is tremendous. I'm a big animal guy, and I love what they're doing for the SPCA. You can find promotional stuff for them on my Twitter and on their Twitter page here. You can see the handle down there, at One Pie Pizza, W-N-Y. They're great people making great pizza. Treat yourself to some great food. And also know that, you know, by going to them and getting your food from them, you're also helping out the community and helping out good causes. So I'm very proud of my partnership and friendship with them now at this point is our professional relationship has grown. So go get yourself some one pie pizza, do some good for yourself and the community. And now we're going to start to dive into this episode, but I do want to pull out some, some comments. I'm going to hit this one. Start from the bottom. Will says I was guilty. I just hit the like, if you're here right now, you should be hitting the like, whether you're watching live, listening later, watching later, whatever have you, I know it's corny. I say it every week. I say this part every week, Likes go a long way towards helping us to track and trend in front of more eyes and ears and all that stuff. It helps myself. It helps the entire Cover One team. It helps us continue to grow and progress as we try to take this thing as far as possible and ride it until the wheels come off. So please, 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 if you are here now or you're here later, drop a like. Um, again, if you like, of course. I don't want anybody doing anything they genuinely don't believe in. But also on the flip side, if you think this episode is bad and you don't want to give it a like, don't give it a thumbs down. Just tell someone you hate about the show. And then, you know, maybe they'll like it or maybe you'll ruin their day. You know, any press is good press. Oh, I see. This is where the comment comes from, from Tim saying 10 out of 35 viewer likes, not great at math, but pretty sure that is an F hit the like. I appreciate you, Tim doing a good job. And you guilted will into liking this. So I appreciate you. And comment from Tim on one pie pizza, equal amount of deliciousness in every slice. I love how you tied it back to my intro from casino about the equal amount of blueberries in each muffin. Yes, of course, equal amount of deliciousness in every slice. And it's a high amount. It's not like it's an equal amount. And it's like eh, five or a six. It's 10 out of 10. Every bite is a 10 out of 10 official stamp of approval from myself. If I had a stamp, I would do that. I should get a stamp. That would be cool. Um, that's for another time. I'm going to get distracted. Ooh, Ooh, comment here from Michael. I like it. Sweet sauce pie equals grandma pie for downstaters who uh, don't know what that means, I think. Yeah, you'll get grandma style, like the thicker crust uh, with a sweet sauce pie and that cheese to sauce ratio, cup of char pepperoni. Very fair, Michael. Well done there. I want to shout out this one from Amy. She says, hey, hey, she says, thank you, Anthony, for your dedication, our time, well-deserved, no guarantees for any position at this point yet solid we are yes the bills are very solid and there are no there are no guarantees for this team for the rookies for the players returning anything and everything and that's that's a really good lead in for this discussion on Kyrie also as I mentioned on Twitter um as I put some stuff out for this episode if there is any breaking news that comes through on any 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 NFL schedule stuff yikes tripping over myself tonight it's been a long day Feel free to put it into the chat. I know the schedule release is officially tomorrow at 8 p.m., but I know there's leaks, official, unofficial, coming in from a variety of sources. You don't know who to trust at this point in any form or fashion. But if you got anything, throw it into the chat. As always, anything you got in the chat. I love doing the live shows here because of the viewership. So any questions, thoughts, comments, concerns, philosophies, ideologies, maxims, whatever have you, throw it into the chat. I will get to anything and everything as I can 
you guys know how we do on disguise coverage. Also, super chats get priority, mainly because I see the color. It flashes, and I bring it up right away. Uh, John is coming in now. What's up, John? Let's dive right into it, folks. The first piece, something I've said all offseason when it comes to how Kyir Elam can unlock this Buffalo Bills defense. The first piece is rock, paper, scissors. And I'm going to explain what that means. I've said it a lot this offseason in my desires for the Bills to upgrade at the corner two position. Yeah, exactly, Jason. Uh, saying about the schedule release, I'll trust it when it's officially released. Yeah, there's a lot of like unofficial official leaks right now and then sources contradicting one another and saying like, no, this leak was fake. This is the real leak. I don't know who to trust anymore. There's a lot of unverified stuff going on, but nonetheless, that news is going to come. Actually, it hasn't been too bad um, at this point. Usually I feel like there's more, but Rock, paper, scissors for Mr. Kyer Elam. It is a phrase that I have used this entire offseason. I used it when prefacing my top priorities and needs for this Buffalo Bills roster this offseason. And the rock, paper, scissors analogy comes from the idea, for those of you who don't know, is if you're playing a game of rock, paper, scissors, which I think we all have for the most part, or Rochambeau, for those of you who like to use that fun word, you can win rock, paper, scissors by just throwing one of them. You can just keep throwing rock or keep throwing paper or keep throwing scissors. Like, it's possible. You can legitimately win. But your odds statistically go significantly higher if you throw rock, if you throw paper, and you throw scissors. What this Buffalo Bills defense has had these past several years is they have not been able to throw rock, paper, and scissors against higher levels of competition, especially athletically. The Bills defense... I'm trying to set the table for this. For those of you who have heard this before, kudos to you for remembering. For those of you who haven't, this is this is also for you. The Bills defense has been very structurally and technically sound the last several years. They are intelligent. They work well with one another. That's why someone like Levi Wallace, who isn't the biggest, isn't the fastest, isn't the most athletically gifted corner, why someone like him can succeed in the Bills defense because of how smart he is, because of how responsible he is. He is that proverbial guy who is in the right place at the right time. His teammates trust him to do his job and be where they expect him to be, as do the coaches. That's how this defense functions. The Bills don't do a lot of exotic stuff on the back end or up front. They're usually just running a four-man rush, and they're playing coverage behind it. Now they'll vary their coverages, and they have different rules and games and things that they play on the back end. But the majority of the time, they are more vanilla on the back end, right? But the reason they're able to be vanilla and still be so successful is because of how technically sound they are and how good of an understanding they have of what their responsibilities are in this defense. And they work so well together. They know, okay, if there's this formation, Trey's going to be here, Levi's going to be here, Hyde's going to be there, Poyer's going to be there, Milano's going to do this, and they all know how to play off of one another with that, right? That's how you can succeed when you just play kind of the same thing over and over again. Compared to what the Seahawks did, the Legion of Boom did, everyone and their mother knew that they were pretty much going to be in cover three, Earl Thomas was going to be that post safety. Cam Chancellor was going to be around the line of scrimmage. You had Sherman staying literally on one side and then the other with Brandon Browner or whoever else they were throwing out a corner to. But everybody knew they were running cover three. People knew that same way with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers when they were running the Tampa two. And then the Chicago Bears started doing it. Everybody knew Brian Erlacher was going to be functioning as like a deep third player almost and splitting those safeties. And everybody knew that Tim Jennings and uh, Ricky Manning and Charles Tillman were going to be you know, those corners, those outside cover two corners, Tampa two corners. But if you play a scheme so well and you're able to adjust at all times and you're able to continuously stay fluid, it's hard to beat a really sound scheme and a really sound structure. That's what the Buffalo Bills have been defensively, right? And it's the reason they were so good. And I know people talk about, well, look what happened against the Chiefs or look what happens when they play better offenses. That doesn't mean they're not a good defense. The problem is they've had matchup problems. They are a defense because they are technically sound, right? But they're not overly athletic. They're not overly fast. They've got guys who are fast. Edmonds for his position is fast. Milano is quicker than fast. Trey White is probably the fastest in the secondary, but he's not a burner by any means. He's not a guy who came out and ran a 4-3 or a 4-4. He's not staying step for step with burners on the outside. He, again, is more technically sound. He can stay with those faster guys because of his hands and his feet and his hips and his intelligence and his football IQ, but he's not overly athletic. 
and from a speed perspective, right? He's not big. He's not tremendously strong. And Hyde and Poyer are flexible and so versatile, but neither are burners. Neither are huge thumpers. They are technically sound. They make impact plays. But what you have is this resounding high technical ability for this Bills defense, which is fine. But when they come up against certain offenses, the past couple of years, it's been the Chiefs who have this next level physical ability, whether it's in the Chiefs instance, speed, they have trouble staying with those kind of guys, right? And it's because they are not overly fast as a defense. And you can still win if you don't have that necessary trait to fight fire with fire, right? You can still win. But the problem is, I've said this entire offseason, if you're Levi Wallace, right, and you're covering Tyreek Hill, you can still cover him, even if he goes vertical, even though he's way faster than you are. Tyreek Hill is arguably the fastest player in the NFL. Levi Wallace runs a 4 6 so not too fast for Levi. But you can still cover Tyreek Hill, but your feet have to be perfect. Your steps have to be perfect. Your hand placement has to be perfect. Your anticipation has to be perfect. You have to be so on point from a technique and an execution standpoint that if you're not, you're getting beat. We saw it happen against, again, against the Chiefs in the division round this past year. The big Tyreek Hill touchdown before Josh let him down um, to take the lead with 13 seconds. You see that completion to Hill and Poyer and Hyde, their angles are just slightly off coming from the top down to make a tackle on Tyree Kill. And what happens? He gets the angle and he's gone. House, touchdown. That's what happens when you don't have the speed or that ability to match and go fire with fire. Again, you can win. You can still make a play, but your technique has to be perfect. And that, in that example, Hyde and Poyer's angle had to be perfect to make the tackle on Tyree Kill. And guess what? It wasn't. So they got beat. When you have more physical tools, when you have more physical traits, that allows you to be less perfect with your technique and your execution because you have something that can mitigate the false steps or mitigate the errors. You have something that's kind of a, a bit of a safety net. Kyrie Elam represents that safety net. And I said, I say all that to set the table for the rock, paper, scissors piece, because the potential of Kyrie Elam to unlock this Buffalo Bills defense, you've got someone now who has more of that physical ability to to be paired with that technical side, right? You've got a corner who is big at six foot one, 191 pounds. He's fast. He runs a four three nine. I don't think he always plays as fast as that four three nine, but he's got it in him, right? You've got somebody who can now match up with those guys from a physical gifts and a physical tools perspective. And a big piece of that, again, the rock, paper, scissors piece comes if you're throwing rock. And the other team's throwing scissors. Boom, you're good. Boom, you're good. Oh, scissors again. Rock, I win. What happens if they start throwing paper? You lose. If you cannot throw scissors. And that's been a problem for this Bills defense against certain skill sets, certain traits in their opponents. Kyrie Elam represents a change and a philosophical shift away from what they were previously. They now, again, potentially with Kyrie Elam, have the ability to throw rock, paper, and scissors. And that's more important than ever in this AFC. If you are looking at the teams that are going to contend, right? I know everybody's dogging the Chiefs because they lost Tyreek Hill and, you know, Juju is nothing and Valdez Scantling isn't nothing and Sky Moore is a rookie and Travis Kelsey's old and all that kind of stuff. Chiefs are still going to be a player. Mahomes is amazing. Travis Kelsey is still amazing. They're going to be a player. But you look at how the oh, really good comment here from Jason. Jason says, I hope fans have learned from the past that you need to have patience with the rookies because they're going to do quote unquote rookie things. That's very true. Have that patience with rookies. If Kyrie Elam isn't setting the world on fire midway through the year, don't write them off. Don't consider them a bust. I'm fair rule for me. I always like to give it the very least two years, but three years is really the safe one. That's why for me, this upcoming year for AJ Epinesa is so huge. It's year three. What does he do? Usually by year three, you have enough sample size to really firmly decide who a player is and who a player is going to be. So that's a big piece. Um, for him. Oh, and also good comment here from Nathan. Nathan says that the chiefs have rookies in a lot of important positions. That is very true. They're going to need their rookies to step up with the losses they had this off season. They got a lot of good rookies. They had a tremendous draft, but they need them to play well. Kind of like what, you know, Trey Smith and Creed Humphrey did for them last year, two rookies on the offensive line. They really stabilized things for them up front and solidified some things for them up front. So yeah, very good comment uh, with that. Uh, good comment there with that, Nathan. 
terrible with my words tonight. I don't know what's going on with me. But again, the rock, paper, scissors piece, right? You're looking at who the Buffalo Bills are going to have to deal with at some point. Some of these teams that I'm going to talk about right now are regular season opponents, or some of them are going to be ones that you're going to have to get through at some point, somehow, some form or fashion in the playoffs. So you're looking at the Kansas City Chiefs. You're looking at the Las Vegas Raiders. You are looking at the Cincinnati Bengals. You are looking at the Los Angeles Chargers. You are looking at the Denver Broncos, these teams, right, who have mismatch potential left and right in a specific form and fashion, right? The Chiefs with Travis Kelsey last year, and then these are 2021 stats that I'm going over, and it's reflective of their careers as a whole, but these 2021 stats, right? So Travis Kelsey, who's six foot five, 260 pounds, 2021, 45.3% of his snaps came in the slot, 26.5% came out wide, 27.3% came in inline. Darren Waller, tight end for the Raiders, phenomenal, six foot six, 255 pounds. 29% of his snaps came in the slot. 21% came out wide, 49.6 in line. In line just means like in your regular like tight end form, as you would expect, like at the end of the line of scrimmage or in line. T. Higgins, Cincinnati Bengals, wide receiver, six foot four, 215 pounds. 79% of his snaps in 2021 came out wide. Mike Williams, wide receiver for the Los Angeles. Oh, that's a very loud noise outside. Mike Williams, wide receiver for the Los Angeles Chargers, six foot four, 220 pounds. 83% of his snaps came out wide in 2021. Cortland Sutton, wide receiver for the Denver Broncos, six foot three, 218 pounds. 86% of his snaps came out wide. Also on the Broncos, Tim Patrick, six foot five, 210 pound wide receiver, 72.3% of his snaps came out wide. The Buffalo Bills, in order to get to the Super Bowl and get through the AFC, are going to have to deal with teams that have mismatch potential in their weaponry. That's readily available. The Chiefs love to move Kelsey all over the place. The Raiders love to do the same thing with Waller. Higgins and Williams and Sutton, because they're wide receivers, are more, I guess, traditional in the fact that they're going to line up outside. But because of their size and because of their frame, those are guys that were going to give the Bills problems if they came into this year with Levi Wallace. Again, Levi Wallace, six foot, 179 pounds. That's a big mismatch going up against T. Higgins, who's six foot four, 215 or Mike Williams, who's 6'4", 220, or Cortland Sutton, who's 6'3", 218. They've got the height. They've got the length. They've got the weight. They've got the frame. They've also got the speed advantage. I'm not even getting into 40s, but they play fast as well. What Kyer Elam represents is a corner who gives you the ability to play rock, paper, scissors on the outside against those mismatch opportunities. Offenses love to create mismatches, whether it's with talent or whether it's with scheme, right? And the teams that the players I just mentioned, you know, play for, so the Chiefs and the Raiders and the Bengals and the Chargers and the Broncos, those offenses use those players to create matchup advantages for their offense. They know, okay, like if I split out Travis Kelsey here or if I split out Mike Williams here and, okay, I can get a matched up on this corner or this linebacker or this safety, whatever have you, right? It's all about creating that mismatch in a scenario where you know, like, oh, my guy's winning that matchup every day of the week. There's a big difference, no disrespect to Levi Wallace, in Travis Kelsey or any of these guys who I've just mentioned lining up on the outside and knowing that Levi has to cover them potentially one-on-one or even in zone, especially in a zone defense like the Bills defense where they play a lot of pattern match coverage, which basically is zone coverage that functions like man. And even if it was spot drop zone, at some point zone, all zone coverage turns into man anyway. But Kyer Elam, because of his size, because of his length, because of his frame, his physicality, and his speed, he gives you someone that can match up with these guys. And it's not the matchup advantage that the offense wants anymore. Take the Chargers, for example, right? You get Mike Williams, who, again, 6'4", 220 pounds. He can get down the field. He's fast. He's big. He's great at the catch point. He's good at high point in the football. He's physical. He uses his frame. He boxes out corners and defenders. You want a corner who's got some some oomph to his game, some length, some physicality, some frame, right? Oh, and see, great comment here from Claude, who says, with the Chargers, you put Trey on Mike Williams, you put Taron on Keenan Allen, and you put Kyrie on Guyton. That's part of it, right? You can you can now play chess and maneuver your pieces however you want. Or if you wanted, you know what? 
Keenan Allen is such a technician, uh, although he plays majority, he, he plays a lot of snaps in the slot, so you can put Taron Johnson on him, or maybe you want to fight technique with technique, and so you put Trey on Keenan Allen. Or again, you put Trey on Mike Williams on the outside, or you just stay to your sides because you don't have to worry about making certain moves to counteract the mismatch potential. You don't have to hide or cover for a Levi Wallace if he gets into a one-on-one situation with Mike Williams, right? You don't have to take Trey and be like, okay, well, we always got to shadow this guy and move Trey around. You don't have to worry about double covering or bracketing this receiver because you have the ability to play rock, paper, scissors. You have someone in Kyer Elam who you can play rock, paper, scissors with and fight fire with fire because he's got the speed. He's got the length. He's got the size. He mitigates the mismatch potential that the offense is trying to create, right? And again, that's all... That's all everything is. That's why Josh Allen is so tremendous, you know, for, for Bills fans. Because what he can do with his arm, because what he can do with his legs, he is a walking mismatch at all times, right? Offenses are constantly, like I said, whether with talent, just because, like, pff, I know my guy is better than that guy. Let me call plays or put that guy in situations where I can create that one-on-one matchup and let my guy get a bucket every single time, right? And the other side is with scheme, designing plays to be like, okay, my guy is really good, but he's outmatched here. Let me figure out how to scheme him open. Let me figure out how to call plays to take advantage of what the defense is trying to do. You can win with talent. You can win with scheme, but it all stems from the place of mismatch, right? You're creating mismatch potential. And that is where the Bills have lost big games the last several years because that mismatch, that mismatch differential has been huge. Again, I'm going to keep going back to it, even though I know Tyreek Hill is on the Miami Dolphins now, which also, I know everybody wants to make their Tua jokes. Jalen Waddell, Tyreek Hill, Cedric Wilson, and Mike Kosicki is a pretty cool weapons group for Tua. We'll see what he can do with it, but I digress. That's where the Bills have had that mismatch differential has been so huge against the Chiefs because the speed they have with Hill and Miko Hardman combined with the walking chess piece that Travis Kelsey is. You constantly have to account for all these different layers and levels. And I know Tyreek Hill is gone. Sky Moore's good and he can move. Juju Smith-Schuster, I know everybody likes to make the TikTok jokes. He's a better receiver than people realize. He can fly. He's a good route runner. He understands how to leverage space. And anybody who plays with Patrick Mahomes immediately is going to see an uptick in their game. He's better than people think. I know he gets made fun of a lot for TikTok stuff, especially amongst Bills fans and everyone at this point. He's better than you think. The Chiefs still have a good, they don't have as strong of a group without Tyreek Hill. And I agree, John, Sky Moore is not Tyreek Hill. That offense definitely takes a hit without Tyreek Hill. But I think a lot of people are just writing off the Chiefs and be like, well, all they got now is Travis Kelsey. They do have a good supporting cast around him. It's not as great without Tyreek Hill, no question about it. But even with just Kelsey, you've got that mismatch potential. Or if the Bills play the Raiders, right? You've got, in my opinion, the best wide receiver in football in Devontae Adams. You've got a tremendous slot receiver who's still growing in his game in Hunter Renfro. And then you've got, again, another walking mismatch tight end in Darren Waller who can fly for a tight end. And he's six foot six, 255 pounds, right? Yeah, excellent point from John there. When when you have a Mahomes, you're always dangerous. Uh, very true, very true. You've got teams that have the ability. Again, you know what? I'm just going to keep talking about these teams in this aspect as we keep flowing along here. So you got the Raiders, Adams, Waller, Renfro, the Bengals, Higgins, Jamar Chase, Tyler Boyd. Tremendous. The Chargers are more of a two-man game with Wallace and Allen, but Guyton, Palmer, the running backs are so lethal with what they do with Austin Eckler. And then they've got a phenomenal quarterback in Justin Herbert. The Broncos, who I talked about last year, I was afraid of them getting a quarterback. That's why I didn't want them to get Aaron Rodgers last year at the draft. Now they have a bona fide franchise QB and Russell Wilson. Their weapons group is strong. Sutton, Jerry Judy, Tim Patrick. Judy, I think people are overlooking at this point because he's had some injury stuff. And the production hasn't been there, given the hype that was there for him coming out of college. But no disrespect to Teddy Bridgewater and Drew Locke, he hasn't had that quarterback play that he's needed. He gets it now with Russell Wilson. But I mention all those teams and those position groupings because, again, what do, what do they all have? They've got a big, they've got a route runner, they've got a fast guy, or they've got guys that are a combination of all of those things. All of those guys on all of those teams would have presented a significantly higher mismatch differential for the Buffalo Bills if they did not have a corner like Kyer Elam. 
a corner who has some size, who has some length, who has some physicality, who has speed, and who also you can add polish to and technique. Like there are, so you know, he is rough around the edges uh, a little bit, but but I trust the Bills to coach him up like they did with Levi Wallace, like they did with Dane Jackson and all these other guys that they've squeezed blood from the stone with. But Kyer Elam, all of a sudden, you have a guy back there who you have the technical pieces with Hyde and Poyer. You have the technical piece with Tredavious White. Now you add more of a physical presence and physical ability. In addition with the talent, you've got someone who allows you to fight back against the mismatch differential. It reduces that mismatch differential. Your hand with Kyrie Elam isn't forced because of alignment or formation or personnel. Just to use like a small example, say, you're, again, you're playing the Chiefs and you just do not want Levi Wallace matched up one-on-one with Travis Kelsey anytime he lines up wide, right? That means if Travis Kelsey goes to Levi's side, you got to change the call. Were you guys going to be in man, but now you got to be in zone? Are you in man? But okay, you got to make sure the safety shades over the top there. Or do you want to make sure Tredavious White stays on Kelsey? So now you got to rotate uh, Trey to that other side and make him follow Travis Kelsey wherever he goes. Okay, how does that change your game against all the other guys the Chiefs have? Same thing if you're doing it with the Raiders, right? If the Raiders line up Darren Waller out wide and he's one on one with Levi Wallace, that's a huge mismatch. Now, if he's lined up one on one with Kyer Elam, it's still advantage Waller but that mismatch differential has started to reduce a little bit. And also it gives you options because your hand is not forced. You don't have to sit there and say, well, we can't allow this thing to happen. When you, when you tie one hand behind your back and you remove a rock or a paper or a scissors, you are significantly limited because you don't have a full complementary arsenal and a full complement of weapons to go toe to toe with what an offense is throwing at you from a weapons perspective. Right? So, Elam's ability to basically swing that pendulum back towards the defense to allow the bills to dictate a little more to offenses, but at the very least be more reactive in a confident fashion, because what the offense is trying to do again, they're trying to create mismatches. They're trying to take advantage of your weaknesses and maximize their strengths. The potential of Levi Wallace and unlocking the bills defense. Number one for me is this rock, paper, scissors, you know, peace because it increases the versatility of this defense as a whole, because now more things open up for this Buffalo bills, defense, more coverages, more games. The bills are a, are a team that they, they have rules for certain formations in a three by one set. We like to do this. Okay. In a two by two, we like to do this. Okay. At this point in the game against five wide, we like to do this. They have rules for everything. But you can tweak those rules and have more variability and more opportunity and more possibilities when you have a more physically gifted corner like Kyer Elam because you're not as limited. You know, and here's, here's what it is too, like every defense, every offense, defense, whatever, however you want to look at it, they're all picking from the same type of, of thing. Everybody like plays – man coverage and zone coverage and two high and single high, cover three, cover four, quarters, cover two, all these types of things. The same way on offense, all these teams, they all run, everybody runs, you know, sale concepts and 989 and mills and outside zone, inside zone, gap. Well, maybe not as much gap runs anymore, but they all have the same selection of things to choose from. It's just a matter of what dials they turn up and what they actually choose. And what you choose is based on playing to your strengths that you have on either side of the ball and mitigating those weaknesses. Kyer Elam's presence allows the bills to be able to select from more of the menu. They're not as limited to, okay, well, we can't choose this page. We have to stick to page two. Kyer Elam allows you to be like, well, we could play kind of anything on page one or anything on page two. And you know what? Like if he's really good, we could probably look on page three. And that's a huge thing because it allows you to stay versatile. It allows you to stay multiple and it reduces how an offense can force your hand, which also leads into tendency because if an offense knows this is a big piece too, right? With rock, paper, scissors. Think about it. If you're playing someone in rock, paper, scissors, if you know your opponent can only throw rock, you're not going to throw rock. You're not going to throw scissors. You're just going to throw paper because that's the big thing too, right? 
it's not only knowing like, oh, guys, we can only throw rocks, so it's going to be tough for us to win, but maybe we can do it. The other piece and the other side of that coin is if your opponent realizes you can only throw rock, you're done because then they're just going to throw paper and you lose every single time. And that's what Kyer Elam represents. He represents the Bills' ability to throw rock, paper, and scissors, and he also represents the opponent not knowing what the Bills can potentially throw, which is a huge piece. If you're not giving away tendency, if you're not giving away things pre-snap, post-snap, anything like that, you increase your odds of success every single play, no matter – Oh. Appreciate you, Tim. Tim saying, I like when you said he closes the mismatch gap. That's some things up very well. That's what it is. That mismatch differential, right? Certain guys are always going to be great. You are not going to shut down Travis Kelsey and Tyree Kill and Devontae Adams and Cooper Cup and all these guys who are tremendous, right? Like they're going to get theirs, especially in today's NFL where the rules are significantly skewed towards favoring the offense. But what, what you can do is make them inefficient and make life difficult for them. It's the same with going in basketball. Like there's certain players who are just going to score every night. Like they're going to get buckets. You can't do anything about it, but what you can do, can you make them inefficient? You know, if they get 30 points, how are they getting their 30 points? Are they shooting 60% from the field or did you make them shoot like 27% from the field? And did they get theirs, but the team lost and the team got hurt because you made them inefficient. You made them have to work in a different way, right? Kyler, Kyler Elam reduces that mismatch potential for offenses and allows the Bills to stay more fluid, to be more active, more reactive in a positive way. And again, appreciate you, Tim, reducing that mismatch potential and reducing how forced you are into certain calls and certain looks because of the alignment, because of the personnel, because of the formation on the offense. That's a huge thing. If defenses know, if offenses know, like, well, if we come out in this formation, we know they're going to play this. And if they don't, that's fine because we can take advantage of that guy right there over there. If you reduce that, that's a big thing. And that's what the Bills haven't had in certain high-profile matchups because they've lacked a certain athletic profile at corner two. Now that they have that, potentially with Kyer Elam, it's not the whole, like, world is your oyster, but it opens up a lot of avenues and a lot of legitimate possibilities for this Buffalo Bills defense. And honestly, it, it's a defense, again, I, I, want, I want to close on some stats that was good last year already. I know they struggled in the playoffs against Kansas City, especially towards the back end of it, but this is a coverage unit in man coverage. Uh, they were 17th in total man coverage snaps. They were second in completion percentage allowed. They were third in EPA per play. They were second in QBR against, and they were fourth in yards per coverage snap. In zone coverage, they were first in completion percentage against. They were first in QBR against. They were first in yards per coverage snap, and they were first in EPA per play. And they were 25th in total zone coverage snaps. That's a highlight too, right? 17th in man coverage snaps, 25th in zone coverage snaps. Not tremendously high in either. You know why? Because they're one of the few teams that can alternate between both. They live in the light and the dark. Now they play them very strategically because they recognize the limitations they have, but now they can turn that dial up any way they want. They can flip that ratio any way they want, and they're good with both. The problem is, again, they struggled with certain matchups. They struggled with certain profiles in offenses that they faced. And I'm not saying Kyrie Kyrie Elam automatically cures all that and remedies everything, but he is a very large step towards the direction of, again, reducing that mismatch potential. And that is a huge piece right off the bat. Next piece, influencing the pass rush and creating negative plays. I struggled with a title for this topic um, in order to make it fit on the screen, but I kind of like how this one came out. I'm going to take a drink of water. And I appreciate this comment here from Mr. Diggs saying that Ant is a master at rock, paper, scissors, uh, turning the odds in the Bills' favor. And then he says, go Bills, go Bills. Anytime someone says go Bills, if you're a Bills fan, you have to say go Bills back. So this piece right here, right, influencing the pass rush and creating negative plays. This stems from what are the particular aspects of Kyer Elam's game in terms of what he brings. So you're going to hear this a lot. Throughout this entire offseason, you probably heard it already now, whether it was on the draft show, um, one of the many draft shows we've done on cover one, post-draft analysis, the Kyrie Elam film room that myself, Eric Turner, and Kendall Mursky did. 
Kyrie Elam's ability to play press man coverage, which for those who don't know, basically means he's right on the line of scrimmage. He's got the receiver in man coverage, wherever the receiver goes, he's going and press just means he's up in his face. He's going to jam at the line of scrimmage. He's not off. So if the receiver's here, he's right here. He's not sitting in off coverage. He's right here and on the snap. Maybe he's going to jam him. Maybe he'll use two hands. Maybe he'll use one. Maybe he'll shade him on the inside and try and force him to the outside. Maybe he'll try to shade on the outside and force him in. At the end of the day, he's his ability to play press man, to get right up in the receiver's face, is a big skill set that he possesses. What's nice about press man coverage is when you're successful at it, you throw off the timing for receivers and their quarterback. Quarterbacks come out of their drop. They snap the ball. And what they're expecting is, okay, I take my steps, one, two, three. I read the coverage. I know this guy is running this route based on practice and timing and rhythm. I anticipate him to be in this spot after my third step or fourth step, fifth step, whatever have you, right? When that guy's not there, then the quarterback has to be like, oh, okay, he's not open. Is someone else open? Oh, okay, do I have to scramble? At the end of the day, all of me, all, all that's really important is, the timing has been disrupted between a quarterback and his receiver, whether it's the primary, secondary, tertiary receiver, the timing has been disrupted, which is a very good thing because it means the quarterback has to go and do something else. What's nice about press man is you can sprinkle it in with someone like Kyrie Elam, as the Bills do with Tredavious White as well at times. You don't have to play it all the time. You can throw it in when the offense is, is least expecting it, or if you smell blood in the water, you can just regularly continue to throw it out time and time again and really attack a weakness that an offense has. And that's a huge piece as well, again, to continue that variability in that chess match of throwing things in here little by little. Do you use it all the time? How much do you turn that dial up? When do you turn that dial down? And when, how much, oh, boom. See, and this is where Tim's, comment comes in. He says, look here, look there. Boom. Von Miller can't wait. That's the point here, Tim. And oh, actually we got a comment here from Paul. Paul says, so do you still think the other corners would be better fits for the defense? Even though Elam allows you to play several different ways, the other corners might not. I'm assuming you're meaning the corners in the draft. I I've always said it like this off season. Like I like Kyrie Elam's skill set. I like his potential. I like him even more knowing all like the off the field stuff and how he prepares and how he sees the game and how professional he is when he approaches it. But he was a guy who I thought the entire time the bills could coach up given his skill set and his traits, his natural abilities. And I like him. I like the fit. I still think there are other corners that would do well because of the higher floor they present in addition to the higher ceiling. As of right now, I may be wrong. I would still take Trent McDuffie. If they were both there at 25, I would take Trent McDuffie over Kyrie Elam every day. If, yeah, Michael says that we all know you love McDuffie. Yeah. If Andrew Booth was healthy, I would take Booth. I also don't think, um, I'll appreciate you, Paul, saying, uh, yes, this year's class. We're on the same page. Um, I also, if Andrew Booth was healthy, I'd take Booth over Elam. But then again, if Andrew Booth was healthy, ooh, he's arguably like, right there with sauce and stingley i mean he was he was people's preseason corner number one that's how good uh andrew booth was last year and what the, the high expectations that people had for him this year um so there are still several corners that i would as of right now we could redraft you know again stingley wasn't going to be there but i would take him over elam sauce same thing um i think the big one for everyone especially because the range they went in and how they were ranked in terms of tier in the draft um i would still take mcduffie over elam right now. Um, I think McDuffie's going to do well. I hate that he went to Kansas city. Um, Paul saying, I'm not aware of his man coverage skills. If we're talking about McDuffie. Yeah, he, he can do man. Um, he, th there's a lot of great clips of him in man, both press and off where guys are running drag routes and he just closes the gap with his speed and his angles to the football and then his tackling ability, uh, at, at, at the point of attack and just his ability to finish, whether it's wrapping up or just with force, you know, he can man cover vertically, he can man cover underneath and he's got great functional zone awareness and how to leverage space in a variety of ways. I loved his hips and his hands and how smart he is as a, as a football player. Um, so yeah, there's a lot to like for everybody. Right. But again, everything is also all about fit. My one thing with McDuffie, I do wonder how he, I don't think the chief's defense is necessarily a girl who would see this is a comment here from X. He says, they're already drafted. Can we wait until they play now? System matters. That's what I was about to say, right? Like the fit is so interesting. 
McDuffie, I wonder how he fits in Steve Spagnuolo's defense with the type of scheme and structure they like to play. So I wonder how good of a fit that is. Whereas on the opposite side, right? Like that's where system matters so much. You can have a guy who, like for me, right? I have McDuffie ranked ahead of Elam. But if you're talking about fit in the Bills defense, I think they're much, 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 much closer, which is why I had Elam ranked in a different tier and below McDuffie, but the pick for the Bills is a different thing. System matters, right? If you take a zone, a primarily zone cover, I'm not saying this is in this example, but if you take a man coverage corner and put him in the zone defense, that corner might do terrible. And then you're setting guys up for failure because you're putting them, you're putting a square peg into a round hole. That doesn't fit. That doesn't work out. System is tremendously important, which is why um, Elam is so exciting of a prospect because his fit is so nice in this Bills defense. And to get back to this point, also really great questions from the chat and good comments. Amy says, are already number one defense, uh, their stats will be adding sacks ratio to the list, not just pressures. That's where this conversation comes in, right? Because this is something I said on Twitter. It's also something that uh, Mr. Bruce Nolan said on Twitter and great minds think alike, yada, yada. A sack is a sack is good. It's always fun to get sacks, right? Like it's, it's an automatic negative unless you hit the quarterback in a way that draws a penalty, but sacks are good, right? They are only one potential negative outcome for an offense when you get pressures. Every quarterback, every quarterback, this isn't, I don't think this is enlightening or like new news. Every quarterback does worse when they are pressured. Their completion percentage goes down. How comfortable they are in the pocket changes. Their touchdown interception ratio goes down. Every every stat that you can think of advanced and raw goes down when a quarterback is pressured. No quarterback wants to be pressured. That is such a key, right? Now, pressuring a quarterback and then getting a sack, that is only one of many potential negative outcomes for an offense when you get a pressure. You can force an incompletion. You can force a throwaway. You could force a throw into traffic that results in an interception. You could force a check down to an underneath receiver and allow your defense to come up and rally and tackle. There are multiple ways to win when you still get pressures. The Bills, as we know, were a very good pressuring unit last year from, again, a pressure perspective on an individual level, team level, but we didn't necessarily see that translate to sacks. I got to pause because Jason noticed the tree. Yep. Change the tree. It's it's May, so Memorial Day month. Got a little red, white, and blue action for, you know, stars and stripes, all that kind of stuff. And got a little uh, red, white, and blue hat and jacket. Uh, Snoopy over there. Kind of looks like uh, Apollo Creed from uh, Rocky Four. So that's a fun thing. But, yeah, I appreciate you recognizing the tree. My wife will be very, very, very happy that you recognize that. But, again, sacks are only one potential outcome. There are a variety of others. What we saw a lot with the Bills, because they played a lot of off coverage in a variety of ways, right? Because they weren't up pressing receivers and tight ends too much. You saw quarterbacks consistently have outlets because they had guys open. So they would see pressure. I posted a clip of Jerry Hughes. Uh, Good luck to him in his future endeavors in Houston. But I posted a clip of Jerry Hughes against Tennessee this past year where he beats the right tackle and gets to Tannehill in just about two seconds, gets in almost right away. It's in it's uh, in the red zone for Tennessee, but Tannehill's got a guy that breaks open because the Bills are in off coverage. And so right as Jerry's about to clock him, Tannehill just chucks it to the left and it's a completion. It's a first down for the Titans, right? Jerry won that rep right off the bat, but the pressure didn't turn into a positive for the Bills defense and a negative for the offense because the Bills were in off coverage and Tannehill was able to find an open guy. If you have players in your secondary who can play press man and mug receivers at the line of scrimmage and throw off timing, all of a sudden that pressure can turn into a sack because, okay, here's the pressure. Let me throw it. Uh Uh-oh, that guy isn't where I think he's supposed to be, and I just got sacked, right? Or that coverage is too close. I can't throw that there, right? Whether it's pattern match zone or press man or man in general, being closer and in closer and tighter proximity to receivers will make quarterbacks hesitate and will make them throw that ball less, right? And comment here from Antonio, that's exactly what it is. Quarterbacks are going to be forced to hold onto the ball when they play against the Buffalo Bills. Trey can play press. Kyrie Elam can play press. 
Taron Johnson can get physical and play a little press in the line of scrimmage, right? And then you add in the size and length of Tremaine Edmonds, the versatility of Matt Milano, the disguising coverage ability and versatility of Micah Hyde and Jordan Poyer, right? It creates the opportunity for more sacks because the quarterback has to hold on to the ball longer because when he is trying to look for outlets, there isn't one. Or again, maybe it's not even a sack, right? Because play this third down scenario, right? Okay, it's third and seven. Guys are locked up. They're mugged up. And quarterback has to double clutch. Von Miller comes around the edge. Boom, sack. Hooray. Yay. The other side of it, again, and this is why pressures are still important and why coverage plays a role. Guys are mugged up. They're locked up. Von Miller comes screaming off the edge. The quarterback knows he's about to get hit, so he's just like, all right, cool, let me throw it away and chuck it out of bounds. That's still a win. You force an incompletion on third down. It's now fourth and seven. The offense punts. That's why pressures are important regardless of whether or not it leads to a sack because there's a multitude of negative outcomes that you can have for an offense when you get pressures, right? Sack, a sack is only one of the negative outcomes. There are a multitude of others, which all become more likely if there's no one open because the DBs are locking up wide receivers and tight ends. There's a multitude of ways for the defense to win, right? Because of pressures and pressures, whether it's a sack or just a pressure in general, pressures and coverage are always related. The front four, and the back four, or back seven, however you want to look at it, are always related, right? And, oh, good comment here from Nathan. He says there are four options when a QB drops back. Incompletion, a pick, a sack, or a completion. With Von Miller and Kyer Elam, we increased our chances with the first three. Is there a number above the number one defense? We should just be D through A. I don't know if I'm missing how I'm reading the end there, but I think I confused myself. But good comment. The idea of what could possibly happen when a quarterback drops back to pass, right? There's a multitude of negative outcomes when you get pressures, and they're tied to that coverage piece. A great coverage unit is kind of nothing without a good front and a good pass rush. And a good pass rush and a good front is kind of nothing if there's no coverage on the back end and dudes are always running open and dudes are always running free. Now... Yes, with the Bills' pressures last year, some of that is on the front themselves in not finishing when they get to the quarterback, not taking proper angles to the quarterback, not retracing properly, not compressing the pocket, getting too wide, things that have to be coached up on the front. But there was a lot of times, again, I mentioned that one Jerry Hughes one against Tennessee, but this happened a lot, where guys would get in and get to the quarterback, but the quarterback would be able to dump it down or they'd be able to to check it past the first down marker on a third and five or a third and six because there was someone open. If you can press and get into the kitchen of wide receivers and tight ends, one, just in general, you're having to make them work harder. Wide receivers don't want to get touched. They don't want to get hit. They don't want to get jammed. They don't want to get rerouted. They don't want corners in their face making life difficult for them and making them having to work for every inch. They don't want that in general, right? But let alone... When they need to get to their landmark and time things up with their quarterback on an important down, they don't want that even more. And so I think a a big piece for Kyrie Elam in unlocking this Buffalo Bills defense, as the graphic shows right here, you know, influencing the pass rush and creating negative plays, the Bills now have a cornerback grouping that holistically have the ability to play press, be physical, and stick to receivers because you don't have to have, you don't have to necessarily worry about, well, okay, this dude is really fast. I can't play up on him like this because if he beats me off the line, I can't recover and I'm going to get burned. Kyrie Elam has that recovery ability, right? He's also got the press man ability to know that I'm not going to get beat too bad at the line. And even if I do, I can still recover. Trey has that. Taron Johnson has that, right? Combine that with a pass rush and a defensive line that should be upgraded this year, right? Von Miller is still one of the top 10 edge rushers in the NFL, and I'm being like devil's advocate, worst case scenario there. Von Miller still offers a lot. Maybe see more sacks. That's how it influences the pass rush. And then creating negative plays. I don't just mean sacks and interceptions, incompletions, throwaways, checkdowns, rally and tackle, right? If it's third and seven, third and six, and the only guy who's open is the running back who leaked out into the flat and the quarterback has to dump it down, everybody rallies and tackles. 
there's a higher chance of success there for the defense than there is, oh, this guy got open seven yards downfield because we're playing two off because we're worried about our corner two being beat vertically or being completely overmatched by a bigger, more physical option that he's covering in front of him, right? Again, what Kyrie Kyrie Elam does Influencing that pass rush and creating negative plays because of his skill set, because of that press man ability, and what it unlocks for, again, unlocks for the entire defense as a whole. Pressures can turn to sacks because you've got receivers that are mugged up, tight ends that are mugged up. Quarterbacks don't have that easy outlet or that quick read in their progression to dump it off because they got a guy open. Or if they do have someone open, it's going to be someone who's closer to the line of scrimmage, who's short of the sticks, and it gives the defense the opportunity to rally, tackle, and get a stop, right? That's how things start to play off of one another little by little and bit by bit. And the last piece I want to mention here, Long term, this one hurts my heart a little bit, but long term stability in the secondary for the Buffalo Bills. This one is something I mentioned early in this offseason, and it's kind of reared its ugly head as we've gotten closer to the start of the season. Jordan Poyer is an unrestricted free agent in 2023. Micah Hyde is an unrestricted free agent in 2024. There's questions at the safety position. Now, the corners, Taron Johnson got his extension last year. He's a UFA in 2025. Trey got his big contract uh, a couple seasons ago. He's a UFA in 2026. And Kyrie Elam gets drafted in the first round this year. At worst, he's got four years. But if he does well, Bills pick up that fifth-year option. You've got a realistic five years out of Kyrie Elam. You've got stability at the corner position. Again, provided Kyrie Elam works out and is a capable corner too, whether it's with floor, whether it's with ceiling, whatever have you, if he proves to be a reliable starter, you've got stability in your secondary because of what you have in the cornerback group and Kyer Elam, Taron Johnson, Tredavious white, knock on wood. And provided there's no outlying craziness are your starting three corners, you know, two outside and then the slot or nickel corner um, in Taron Johnson's case for the next several years locked up. You don't have to worry about it, which is great right? In a vacuum in and of itself, but it's even better when you have significant questions at the safety position. I think there's a very, very realistic chance chance and possibility that Jordan Poyer is not back next year, right? Now, if he goes, I think the odds of the Bills keeping Hyde grow, but there's a chance maybe neither of them are here in two years. And even if only one of them is gone, that's a huge blow For this defense, I've said it on Twitter. I've said it in a variety of episodes here on Disguise Coverage. Hyde and Poyer are tremendous. They do so much for this Bills defense. They are at the forefront of that movement of positionless football on defense, and especially from the safety position. There is no free safety and strong safety with Micah Hyde and Jordan Poyer to to connect it back right to what the Seahawks were doing with the Legion of Boom. Earl Thomas was your free. Cam Chancellor was your strong. Everybody knew where Cam was going to be. Everybody knew where Earl Thomas was going to be, right? And that can work. Like if you've got guys for a system that are so perfect for a system and so good, run that system until the wheels fall off, which is, you know, what they did. And as Paul says here about Hyde and Poyer, they make the defense what it is. They do. When you've got guys that the defense doesn't know where they're going to be, especially in today's day and age where you were trying to disguise so much pre-snap for an offense, right? You are trying to, okay, we're going to line up with, you know, both of our safeties back. And then when the snap happens, we're going to spin one of them down. We're going to be in single high coverage, but maybe it'll be zone. Maybe it'll be man. Maybe we'll show a single high look and actually run a two high look. Maybe we'll show too high and actually run a two high look, so on and so forth. There's all these chess moves and chess potential when you've got positionless guys on your defense, guys like Micah Hyde and Jordan Poyer. You don't know where they're going to be. You don't know where they're going to line up and where they're going to finish. Even if you see where they line up, you don't know where they're going to finish, right? They are so tremendously important because of their versatility combined with how they execute. They execute at such a high level. They were all pros for a reason, right? They are the best safety tandem in football. Their football intelligence and their football IQ are at such a high level. If either of them go at any point, Those are big shoes to fill legitimately. Like even if the bills got, I'm making this up, but even if like one, if if Poyer leaves next year and the bills get the best safety in the draft, 
you're still going to have a drop off because no rookie safety is going to, I shouldn't say no rookie safety, but it's going to be hard for a rookie safety to come in and become an all pro right away. Like Jordan Poyer and, or like Micah Hyde, those are big shoes to fill. How, where does Kyrie Elam fit into this? Well, it's nice to know that you've got stability at the corner position. If you are having to revamp and if you're having to find new safeties, right? Especially ones that are that good and that important to the Buffalo Bills. It makes any new incoming safety, it makes their job easier if they've got stability in front of them in the rest of the secondary. If they're like, well, okay, cool. I can lean a little on my all-pro corner, Tredavious White. And, okay, Kyrie Elam's going into his second or third year. He's been killing it, and he's still on the rise. Awesome. Okay, we have one of the best nickel corners in the entire game in Taron Johnson. Okay. And then from a coach's perspective and a defensive coordinator's perspective, again, you can start to cover up some of those holes and mitigate some of those deficiencies when you've got strengths in other areas. Not even just talking the rest of the defense, but in that secondary, right? The corners and the safeties are one collective unit. I know they're different on the depth chart and different from a positional grouping standpoint. But when you've got stability in the secondary, that's huge because there's going to be some change and some turnover in this secondary, especially at the safety position as we start to move forward. I really, I don't want to put an odds number on it because I think that's that's always tough to try and like guesstimate what that what's that going to be, what that is going to be like, and what's it going to look like. But for me right now, I feel like it's a toss up 50-50 in terms of whether or not Jordan Poyer is back next year, and that's a huge void on the field and off the field. He's a great locker room guy. He's a leader. He rallies the troops. He's smart as hell. Like he does a lot not just for the secondary, not just for the defense, for the entire team. That's going to be a hard dude to replace, right? And if Hyde goes at some point, even more so. And even with both of them, right? Even if they both stay two, three years from now, do they see a drop off in play? How gracefully do they age? Some of those questions aren't too terrible to ask when you've got a strong cornerback grouping in Tredavious White, Taron Johnson, and Kyer Elam. And Comment here from Spin saying Poyer and Hyde allowed the corners uh, not needing to be elite. Now having high-end talented corners will allow a safety to be at a lower level if we lose Poyer uh, or Hyde. Safeties can cover for corners and corners can cover for the safeties. That's exactly it, right? What can you hang your hat on? What can you lean on? And I think that's spot on, Like, which is why the draft pick also of Kyrie Elam is so exciting because if you're increasing that elite top end level in your corner grouping to pair up with your high end elite all pro safety tandem. Oh boy. Like now you raise your floor of your defense. Now you raise the ceiling of your defense. And again, like we talked about in, 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 in the beginning of this episode, the possibilities and the avenues become not endless, but tremendously exciting because there's so many things you can do when you have this collective high end unit. Now, the other side of that, and still a good way is, Okay, if one of those groupings start to fall a little bit, the other one being elite allows you to still cover and mitigate those weaknesses and mitigate some of those holes and cover up for some of those deficiencies. So that's a good thing with Kyrie Elam. It's something I mentioned earlier in this offseason and was part of the reason why I wanted a corner in the first round because of that fifth-year option. Because if you hit on that corner in round one, that fifth-year option is tremendous. Knowing that you've got stability and quality at a premier position in the NFL for five years and especially a cost controlled, you know, quality at that with Josh Allen and Stefan Diggs's contract and Tredavious White's contract and anybody else that gets signed. What, what does that Oliver's deal look like? What does Dawson Knox's deal look like? Is Tremaine Edmonds going to get re-signed? Do they pay up for Jordan Poyer? All these types of deals that are going to have to be accounted for as you move forward to have a premier position like corner and to have a good one and to have them under cost control for four to five years, really important, really big thing as we start to move forward. Because again, this is where the whole sustainability factor comes in for a team, right? It's not just being good for this year or next year. It's how can you consistently be good every single year for five to 10 to 15 years? And a huge piece of that is foresight and thinking moves ahead and years ahead. And a lot of that is tied to contract flexibility. And then the second piece of that is tied to evaluating talent properly, drafting properly, and continue to churn the talent, have a strong bench, 
continue to re-up, have that be a strong pipeline so you can continue to fuel and support your starting grouping and continue to drive performance and sustainability in your team. And ooh, let's see, comment, what does Spin say here? Spin says, when it's time to pay Elam, White will be on the back end of his contract and will not demand top dollar. Elam becomes the elite corner and then can have a lesser corner for a couple years than draft a... Uh, high CB. Oh, and Spin says, I cannot type career, not contract. I knew what you meant there on the bet. Well, technically, he will be on the back end of his uh, contract, Trey, Trey White, with that extension. But yeah, back end of his career. I mean, let me take a drink of water here. Again, it's just a possibility. Like, maybe Trey does command top dollar. Maybe he doesn't. Either way, if Elam is sweet, it opens up your possibilities. You're not pigeonholed. Your hand is not forced because you're like, well, we have to pay Trey because, you know, we don't have a corner to, or, well, all right, we have to draft one or sign one because we can't afford Trey or we have to supplement Trey. We have to do something like, you know, you've got something in-house already, right? Again, the possibilities, the avenues, all these, you know, this world of possibilities and dreams that Kyir Elam offers all because of that potential, because of his skill set, because of where he was drafted, because of the position that he plays, what it does. It is a domino effect in a variety of ways for this Buffalo Bills defense on the field and off the field. And again, like we mentioned in the beginning, it's all potential, right? He hasn't played a down of football. He could be exactly what everybody thinks he is. He could be 10 times better. He could be 10 times worse. We could be sitting here a year from now or two years from now, and everybody's saying, man, I can't believe Kyer Elam didn't go before McDuffie and didn't go before Sauce Gardner. I can't believe he didn't go in the top 20, things like that, right? Or we could be sitting here a year now, a year from now or two years from now being like, man, the Bills really missed when they traded up and got Kyer Elam. That was a terrible pick. I wish McDuffie fell or I wish they took Kyler Gordon or I wish they waited till the second A lot of uncertainty, a lot of variables that still have to be worked out because, again, we have not seen these guys take a professional snap. There's a lot to determine and a lot of variables to remove in order to figure out who these guys are going to be both on the field and off the field. And both of those things are tremendously correlated and connected, right, as these guys adjust to life as a professional football player in the NFL, both on and off the field. But the potential is tremendously exciting, you know, first and foremost because of that rock, paper, scissors piece. You've got teams that are really going to try and create mismatches with their personnel groupings, with their alignments, with their formations. Kyer Elam reduces that mismatch differential. He reduces the need for your hand to be forced on the defensive side of the ball. He reduces how much you're pigeonholed based on what the offense is doing, which is invaluable. Like that's tremendous to know that you've got more options on the menu to select from instead of having a limited menu, more choices, more options means more possibilities, which also means more unpredictability for the defense from the perspective of the offense, which means they can tendency hunt and they can't, diagnose and really scheme things up as easily if they don't know what's coming. And then you look at that press man ability, right? His individual skill set, one of his highest, you know, rated qualities and pieces and attributes, however you want to verbalize it, that he brings to the team and what it does for the rest of the defense, potentially leading to pressures turning into sacks, potentially leading to forced incompletions or bad throws or check downs, just leading to a multitude of negative opportunities, potentially a multitude of negative opportunities and plays and results for the offense and a multitude of positive ones for the defense. And then you're looking at the long-term stability in the secondary, his status as a first round pick, the contract, the potential, the premier position, man, with Tredavious White and Taron Johnson, that's tremendous in and of itself, but especially factoring in that we don't know what the safety position is going to look like for the Buffalo Bills next year, two years from now, three years from now. So having stability both on the field and from a contract and term perspective at the corner position is very, very, very important to this defense and also very important to the secondary as a whole. And I'm seeing some comments here, uh, comment here on James Bradbury. I have a question from Paul. Do you think we can get Bradbury? I don't think we got the cap space, but I'd love, I'd love it just as insurance, uh, for white to get healthy. I would love James Bradbury. Um, I think they go for more of a cheaper veteran corner. I wanted Bryce Callahan. He signed with the chargers. Um, as so many people did this off season. Um, I think he's more like the Joe Hayden's of the world 
start to be looked into and called upon and tapped into. Um, I would like a veteran added just from a depth perspective, whether Trey's healthy or not. I just think corners are premier position uh, for any team, but especially the Bills. Having more reinforcements there um, and a veteran presence is never a bad thing, so I would like the Bills to add there. I don't think they're going to get Bradbury, and as people in the chat are saying, money seems to be a play. One of the reports that came out was I think the Giants had multiple trade um, trade offers and trade potential for Bradbury, but the money in the deal, like potential contract extensions and what teams wanted Bradbury for and what he was willing to play for wasn't really working out. And I think he wants, you know, to some of the comments here, uh, Nathan saying Bradbury's expensive. He's going to want big money. Steven saying Bradbury's not signing a one-year deal. Yeah. It seems like he wants term and he wants money. Um, I would love, 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 um, James Bradbury on a one-year deal, even if it's just to supplement Trey taking his time and getting back healthy. And then you let Trey really fully, which they're going to do anyway, but you let Trey really fully recover. Don't rush him back. Come in October, just kind of chill. And then you allow Bradbury to, you know, function as your top corner or, you know, he's not going to get beat up by Elam, you know, for the top spot. But yeah, if you let him function as your top corner and then start to work Elam in, or even if Trey is ready for the start of the season, I like the idea for any rookie of letting them get their feet wet and starting to bring them in little by little um, and not to put too much on their plate too fast and having Bradbury or Bradbury added to this defense in the secondary, I think would be a huge piece. I think he's a scheme fit. I like what I saw on the tape. I like what I've heard um, from those I trust in the giants world um, and DMS and different conversations I've had with guys who watch the tape and grind the film who have spoken very highly of Bradbury, but yeah, I don't think, I don't think he's going to take a one year deal, which is probably what he'd have to sign to come to Buffalo or one or like, I was saying he could sign a two year, but even that seems a little unrealistic. Um, then you combine that with the money that he's going to want. I think he's looking for money and I think he's looking for term. Both of those things reduce the possibility of him coming to the Buffalo bills. So no, I don't see it in the cards that James Bradbury will be coming to the bills. Um, especially now, maybe if the bills didn't draft a corner in the first round, um, and maybe if they didn't get one as much as they like, like, like Kyer Elam, who they just, they targeted him. He had a first round grade for them. He was on their board. They really liked him. The fit is there. He ticks all the boxes off the field and on the field for the most part for the Buffalo bills. So with how much they like him, not that they're ever satisfied and complacent and won't continue to try and get better. Um, but yeah, I just don't see it being in the cards based on the money he's going to want, the term he's going to want and, uh, what the bills have done. And, uh, I see the comment here from pop saying the one year deal worked out great for Mitch, uh, Trubisky. It did different market though. Trubisky was trying to kind of reclaim his career, um, and try and rebuild himself a little bit. And, versus being a guy like Bradbury who's proven who had a really, really, really good year two years ago. And then even wasn't tremendously bad this past year. Um, but it, it's different. Mitch was trying to reclaim um, some stability to his name and to his game um, and rebuild himself a little bit. Whereas Bradbury is still one. He's at a premium position, but he hasn't had that drop off. He's not a reclamation project for teams. He's closer to being a finished project. And I mean, I mean, I guess there's some teams where he could sign where he's not like an immediate pencil in starter, but for most teams, James Bradbury is at worst, like your number two corner. Like he's, he's, he's really good. And with how, how good he is and how many teams need a corner and what teams rosters look like and the opportunities that he can have on the open market, I don't see him. There's going to be plenty of opportunities for him to get a contract that makes him a full starter right away and probably also pays him some money. Now, whether or not that team is going to be good, that's a different thing. I don't know how much winning or getting a championship or title means to him, but it's just a little different with things from Trubisky because <clears throat> Trubisky was trying to rebuild himself and build himself back up, whereas Bradbury is not. Um, and it was more just a, a cap casualty that is part of a rebuilding team and um, you know didn't really fit in with their plans. And he's going to have a lot of options, um, a lot of options on the market. And unfortunately... I think those options significantly hinder the chances of him coming to the Buffalo Bills. Throwing up the banner there that says, toodles, you guys. Oh, yeah, I was literally just thinking that in my head, Nathan. Nathan said he's going to the Rams. I literally was thinking that. 
in my brain. I was like, you know, the Rams could sign him. He could be like a really good corner for them opposite of Jalen Ramsey. Um, the Rams sign everyone. I don't know how. Or he'll go to the Saints. He'll go to some team that doesn't have cap space, and he'll sign like a three-year, $40 million deal, and we'll all sit here and go, is the cap a myth? Like, how did he sign with that team? That's what will probably end up happening. But I put up the toodles, you guys, because we're starting to wind down here. I want to thank everyone who rode with me here on this episode live of disguise coverage. The chat was jumping. The questions were good. The thoughts were good. The comments were good. I apologize if I did not get to everything riding solo on these episodes. It's tough to fully read everything while I'm speaking and continuing the conversation, pulling the notes, but I appreciate everybody who engaged, who was here, who was present. Please drop a like if you haven't already. Please, 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 please. It's tremendously important towards helping myself and the entire channel to track and trend in front of more eyes and ears. Yeah, I see you, Pops. I don't want him to go to the Pats either. That would be – I could also see that happen, especially with them not having J.C. Jackson. That would be oh, – that would be disappointing. But – Thank you to everybody who wrote with me live here on this episode. If you are watching later, listening later, whatever have you, thank you very much for your listen, your view, your download. I appreciate every single ounce of support in any shape, form, and fashion that it comes. I hope you guys do well. Take care of one another. I hope you and your family and friends and loved ones are all staying safe. Be kind to one another. Appreciate you. Uh, <laughs> Hold on here. Hold on here. I got, I got to read this comment from Michael. Michael said, I got totally hosed on a blueberry muffin and sent you a pic on Twitter and you didn't even share my frustration. Just saying, I don't, oh, I, I, I need, I'm going to need some proof. Feel free to tweet at me right now and I will check it after I close down this episode and do some stuff. But I need to see that. I need proof, Michael. And if it, and if, and if that, if I messed up, if that was a faux pas, I apologize, but I need the proof. I need the proof, Michael. Tell me. Show me. I appreciate all the kind words starting to come through. Everybody saying great, uh, uh, <laughs> great show and all that. And, oh, there are Amy saying, uh, you and your wife are brilliant. Go Bills. Yep. She's all the tree and the decoration and everything behind me. So major kudos and credits to her. Um, I hope she doesn't see this part because she's going to never let me forget it and um, talk a whole bunch of smack. But I appreciate you, Amy. Thank you so much. And I appreciate you guys. And I will see you next week. We got more on the docket for disguise coverage. I'll be back in the cover one film room again next week with Eric and Kendall Mursky. Please tell all your family and friends and loved ones about disguise coverage and cover one and all that kind of good stuff. Go get yourself some one pie pizza. It is the best in Buffalo. I will see you next week. And as always go bills.